think uh, I think we should be live in a couple of seconds here. So, okay. but um, but yeah, I'm uh, I don't know. I, I I feel like I feel like watching stuff like that is just as valid as making me watch. Like um, I think the big one that people have been the most surprised that I haven't seen yet. I have not seen a single Jurassic Park movie. Really? I've, I've never seen it. Like I've seen clips from them. I've seen significant scenes from them. I know about clever girl and I know about the kid who <laughs> he was on the fence when it went electric and he got shot off real fast, you know, but I have not like watched Jurassic Park, like all the way through. Not, not a single one of those movies. Wow. So, yeah, I know. Like that one is the one that, that I think has gotten the most like, what is wrong with you? You know, from people. You, you, so. you know, you're not alone on that. I have a friend who up until I think two, two or three years ago, she had never seen any of the Jurassic Parks at all. Really? And I finally let her borrow the original trilogy because I have those on Blu-ray. Let her borrow those. Okay. And she came back and said, she liked the first one. The other two were stupid. Like, well, I mean, it happens. It happens. Yeah, you know, you can only, uh, you know, like maybe maybe it was just too much at once for her, you know. I I don't know. Mm -hmm. Possibly, uh, possibly, but, but she but she had like I'd never seen any. Of the, she she gave a list of all movies that she had never seen, and it's like like you've never seen any of the Back to the Futures, you've never seen any of Jurassic Park. <laughs> Those are like staples. You've at least seen one just on basic cable. You should have seen one on basic cable. When I when I found out my youngest sister had not seen Back to the Future, she was probably she's probably 16, 17 by this point. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, you need to you need to come with me right now. I'm gonna sit you down in front of the TV yeah. and I'm gonna make you at least watch the first one. And uh and and you know, I was right. She loved it. I knew she would, you know, because I, because I, I know, I know the little nerd quite well. So, all right, okay, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, um, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the holiday stories episode, because you know, they don't come around that often. They do not. But, um, you know, the, the good ones, the good ones you remember. So, I think it's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Okay. So we ready? We're ready to get Let's it on the way. Let's do it. All right. Okay. All right, guys. For those of you that are trickling in and are here for the podcast, here we go. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Webline, a podcast about Spider Man and his amazing world. Here, we discuss all aspects of our favorite web slinger in a fun, informal, but informative forum. I am your humble host, the Spidey Librarian, and with the holiday season firmly upon us, we're diving into another installment of Spidey Reads, the webline's look through Spider-Man and Spidey-adjacent comics to talk about the ones most worth reading. Rejoining me for this episode of Holiday Cheer is Aaron Garcia of the Front Row Negative podcast, and as it happens, the generous soul who gifted me this lovely Spider-Man shirt I'm currently wearing. Thank you so much for this lovely gift, Aaron, and how are things in your world? They're good. Uh, yeah, there's the shirt. I'm glad you like it. Uh, I'm glad that it fits. I'm glad we're the right size. Oh, no, uh, it's wonderful. I love it. So, uh, but I am doing good. It, it is the season of joyous gift giving. It is the season of the red and green. But most importantly for me, it is the season of holiday themed drinks, especially of the <laughs> hot kind. And I am not afraid to admit it. I am all about that pumpkin spice life or that peppermint spice life because I am a dad that needs energy, needs caffeine, and I was always on the go. And if it's not coffee, it's got to be something else to keep me going. Kids oh. are 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 there. I I can I can you know as as someone who does not have kids, I can only imagine. So I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I I do not begrudge you anything that you need to do or uh, drink or or otherwise consume in order to you know um, get through the what I'm sure is quite a big rush for for the holiday season. So yes. 
Anyways, welcome back to the podcast. It's always good to have you here. And uh, just very quickly, before we get to the segment, what is your just kind of really quick take on Spider-Man or holiday-themed Spidey stories? Ooh, they're always fun because you really get the emotional side of Peter Parker, his, his dual identity. I mean, Spider-Man gives no matter what. He's the guy who will fight a lion to save a guy who can easily jump out of the way. He's that type of person. That's true. But with holiday stories, they really accentuate him in his emotional output of saving everybody. He's always giving, and they give you that first and foremost, he does everything for anybody. And they, they really focus in on that. And they also focus in on his uh, personal side with him trying to help everybody as mm -hmm. Peter. So you, you really get those fleshed out, well-written stories of a good guy trying to do good things, both sides of the identity. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like a common theme in, in holiday stories, of course, is not just sort of like, you know, connecting with your loved ones and everything, which of course is, you know, one of, one of the big themes, but kind of just being able to connect with humanity in general. And even if it's just like one person, you know, trying to, trying to kind of take what is, you, you know, could be construed as the kind of generous, the spirit of generosity in the holidays um, and, and trying to give of yourself on someone else's behalf, which, mm -hmm as you put before, Spider-Man does all the time. So um, it's kind of interesting to watch how the holiday season puts its own kind of special twist on that from time to time. So, mm -hmm. all right. I think, I think a good example I was given or I read was that Spider-Man during the holiday season is like putting a spotlight on Bob Cratchit and taking away from Scrooge. I like that actually. I, I never considered that and I like it quite a bit. So Thank you for that. Webline streams on Sundays at 2 p.m., except for this one where we're streaming on a Monday at 8 p.m. <laughs> uh, we 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 had a bit of uh, we had a bit of scheduling difficulty this time around, but I really wanted to do this episode, so I was like, let's let's do it another day, and so we're 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 yeah. doing it this time um, at mon on Monday at 8 p.m. Central Time. So. Mm -hmm. Anyways, they are on my YouTube channel. Uh, be sure to subscribe there as well as your favorite podcast service and leave us a like, review, and follow where appropriate. If you're on a service that doesn't carry the web line, let me know by shooting me an email at spideylibrarian at gmail.com and I'll do what I can to get it pushed out to you. And finally, for those of you here on the live stream with us today, please be sure to thwip the like button and chime in with your perspectives in chat. The Spidey Librarian Patreon gives listeners of the podcast and viewers of my YouTube channel the opportunity to join my growing community as I create content about our favorite wall crawler. There's currently the $5 Spider Society Citizen tier, which will get you shout outs on the podcast, as well as a special thanks on my uploaded YouTube videos access to the private feed featuring reactions and behind-the-scenes posts, and a special role on the Spidey Librarian Discord server, Spider Society Citizen. More perks and possibilities will arise as we grow, including the prospect of early access to videos, patron-only videos and streams, and appearances on live streams and the podcast. So join the Spidey Librarian Patreon today and help grow our Spider Society Citizen tier into a full-blown Spider-Man community. But before we do a daring deep dive into our timely topic, it's time to dish on the latest spiderific developments with our knockout news segment, The Bugle News Flash. Okay. All right, we got a few news items this week. All right, the first one uh Aaron, you saw the you saw the Marvels, right? I have not seen the Marvels yet, but I are, I've already been spoiled on the after credits ending. And okay. I've already been spoiled on a few of the things that have, that have happened in the movie. Okay, so you have you have you seen the press with regards to it being like the lowest grossing, lowest performing MCU mm. movie of all time, and it's been getting a lot of flack in the in the press. The last I, I, 
Yes. I've heard of that. And I don't know why. I mean, it looks like it's a fun movie. Uh, it I looks mean, to be fun. Yeah, I can confirm. And I, I, I can, I've, I've seen it and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And recently, as in uh, probably about a week ago, um, Disney CEO Bob Iger made some comments about the Marvels being shot during COVID mm -hmm. and that there, you know, there, there, there wasn't enough like corporate supervision on set and that's probably why it failed. And it was just kind of like, it, it was very kind of, I don't know. I don't know if you're familiar with Bob Iger. I've seen the man speak a couple <laughs> of times. The dude is very clearly a billionaire who he, he is, he is, he strikes me as being very out of touch. He does not okay. understand what goes on in the lives of, you know, the, the little people I'm putting that in air quotes, <laughs> you know? Um, anyways, so that comment of course, raised a lot of eyebrows and a lot of people had some not nice things to say to Bob Iger about what, what came off as a very kind of out of touch and arrogant assessment of why the Marvels failed. Mm -hmm. Well, the director of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, uh, Peter Ramsey, basically is one of the latest people to call out Bob Iger for his comments. He basically went on Twitter, Twixter, whatever you want to call it, and basically kind of retweeted what, uh, you know, the article about what Iger said and basically uh, put the phrase, and this is, uh, this is an astounding level of bullshit, essentially. <laughs> and he his 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 reasoning you know i, I read a little bit further his, his reasoning was like how do you know that you know the the lack of supervision is what caused all the problems how do you know that like for instance thor love and thunder which i don't believe was shot during covid you know it was shot like afterwards like mm -hmm. like that didn't do very well either you know and it's 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 like it's like this is this is a this is this is a bullshit remark, and I'm calling it what it is. And uh, you know, this is this is not a Marvel Studios person. This is obviously a Sony person. Yeah, but I do I do kind of like that someone is going out there. You know, like he's not the only person going out there, but I like seeing a Spider Man alumnus going out there and being like, "Dude, that that comment stinks. What are you thinking?" And really get get your head out of there. You know, um, I don't know. Do, do you do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I think Bob Iger is a rich guy who looks to make money from movies and, he, and he assumes that every Marvel film adaptation show, any of that, he hopes for end game level return yes. because in game, let's, let's be honest. End game has probably been Marvel's biggest movie grossing. Uh, he wants the uh, Ant Man three budget with end game return, yes, and that's just he's going to be disappointed, and he is disappointed. At the same time, the rep from Sony coming out to say those things, and uh, Sony's track record with Spider Man movies are it's it's about as spotty as the villain in in the animated Spider Verse two. <laughs> it's funny to hear that, um, but they, but again. For every Marvel's movie we have, we have Morbius. For every Ant-Man 3, we've got Venom. So it's, 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 a, it's a balance of throwing mud at each other and from different companies. It really does come off that way. And I mean, like, I really sometimes just wish that people like Bob Ar Iger, sorry, that people like Bob Iger would just kind of collect your paychecks, shut up, stay off the mics. And, you know, like, you know, I mean, I wish they didn't collect those kinds of paychecks anyways. Yeah. I, think, I think the dude makes like $80,000 a day or something like that. Um, and, and it's, and it's just like, okay, you, you see how mm -hmm. you're the problem. Right. And I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyways. Um, it was just like, after reading those comments originally, I was just like, you know, I, I I literally own one share of Disney stock um, <laughs> just because I want to own like one tiny little sliver of a micron of Marvel, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was just like, I, 
stop talking, man. Stop talking, you know? Yeah. So it's nice to see someone else that isn't just, that isn't me going out there and saying it. Um, and again, he's not the only one, but th- that's the one I'm going to highlight for this news item right here. <laughs> True. Um, so you, uh, oh, that's right. I'm, I'm in the middle of editing the podcast episode we did two weeks ago when okay. <laughs> a certain eight limbed, uh, villain sort of took over my body for the news segment oh frank how's frank doing uh frankly he's been better (laughs) um in any case um he i I believe he made mention didn't he make mention um like they had talked about a spider-man noir series or something like that oh yeah with uh wait without nick cage uh, yes, yes. And apparently, apparently without Peter Parker, too. Like, like this is just going to be some new spider person that they're going to make up is 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 how it sounds, at least so far. Um, but they actually have found a co showrunner, uh, someone by the name of Oren Uziel is was already tapped to be like a showrunner for that particular production. But apparently they've gotten a. They've signed on with another showrunner, uh, Steve Lightfoot. Do you recognize that name? It sounds familiar. He apparently he, he is apparently no stranger to show running Marvel shows. Apparently, he was the showrunner for Netflix's The Punisher. Okay. And, and now, have you have you seen that? I have seen that. I have okay. seen that. I have only seen the first three episodes of that show, which. I didn't stop watching because it was bad. I just stopped watching mm-hmm. because there was other stuff for me to do and and other stuff to grab my <laughs> attention. But I do remember those first three episodes and I freaking loved them. I liked the the interplay between Frank, <laughs> Frank, and um <laughs> and um what was his name? Micro? The Microship. The, yeah, that guy. Like yeah. that those the the kind of face off between those two was excellent and so mm-hmm. i do want to watch the rest of that show but i think um i i think based on the three episodes that i've seen of the punisher like having this guy in your corner is probably not a bad move for something that could be pretty gritty like a spider-man noir story um your thoughts well first thing i'd have to ask how can you have Spider-Man noir without Spider-Man? It's just going to be noir and a bunch of black, white, and gray backgrounds running behind the scenes. I, I mean, ha- at this point, we just don't know. I mean, and it's not without Spider-Man. It's without Peter Parker. And so I I don't know. Well, and again, I, I could be wrong on that. They, it, it sounds like they are not going to go with Peter Parker. It sounds like they're going to try to, you know, I'm I'm not saying they're going to use like Cindy Moon for example, but they might use like someone else maybe who has you know been Spider-Man in a different multiverse or maybe it'll be a new character I I don't know, but like essentially they are they're trying to from my understanding they're trying to not use Peter Parker for everything. And it's okay. also possible that Sony might not be able to use Peter Parker for things because Peter Parker is being used by Marvel Studios right yeah. now. So I, I, I don't know that you're asking excellent questions that <laughs> I don't have good answers for. It's, it's difficult because again, Sony is so this is Netflix through Sony, correct? No, uh, this is um this is Amazon Prime. Or Amazon, Amazon Prime through Sony or through, through Sony. Sony. Yeah. So I, I, I like how Sony's doing all these Spider-Man side characters, bringing them forward trying to flush them out for movies Mm -hmm. that's fun i mean the problem though is that you're starting you're running out of idea you're running out of ways to have a have a person or character connected to spider-man without spider-man in the media whether it be a show a movie some of these characters are directly involved because they spawn them off venom is a big a good example because let's be i mean parker wore the suit first went to Brock. There's mm-hmm. a whole kind of divorce level of uh, story writing. And you didn't get that in the, in the Venom movies. They just kind of completely omitted it. Yep. 
we had Morbius. No Spider-Man at all. And if you've ever read a Morbius comic, him experimenting on himself, uh, Spider-Man was involved in, in that whole uh, storyline, the whole origin storyline. So really, I don't. Uh, it's been a while since I've read it, but you're you're probably right. I'm I'm just having a hard time recalling. So, so it's so, Spider-Man Noir was a great read. Yes, uh, I read that. I read Punisher Noir. I think there's also Daredevil Noir. So, th so they did they, they, at one time they were building up all these noir characters, which was right fun. Frank or uh, Frank Castle, aka the Punisher. Had more of a Godfather type feel, where you know his his dad's business was being over muscled by like gangsters and henchmen. He had Daredevil, who was like you know basically go back and watch the Netflix Daredevil show where he had the black suit and you had that. Uh, oh hey Le Leah, 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 how you doing? Uh, Just felt I, I felt like I <laughs> that one. Uh, but how would you have Spider Man Noir without Spider Man? Or without Peter, unless they're going to bring in a version of Kane or a version of Ben Riley, or like, like that's what I'm wondering. Like maybe they're going to use like Peter Parker without naming him Peter Parker, and then they'll name him Ben Riley or Kane, Kane Riley or something. You know, <laughs> like something. they're probably going to avoid Parker. But like I, I, I wonder if that's kind of their way of kind of side skirting the the issue. You know. So. It could be fun. It, I, I'm my, my whole mindset now is how are they going to do the art style, the animation and the art style? How is that going to happen? Well, we still because... don't know if it's live action. I mean, again, uh, uh, Steve Lightfoot mm -hmm. worked on The Punisher. That was a live action show. It was. So I'm wondering, you know, like we don't know. We don't know about the um, Silk show. We don't know about. Spider-Man Noir or anything else they may or may not be developing, whether or not they're uh, live action or mm -hmm. animated yet. I'm kind of assuming that they're live action until like they say it's animated. Like, I feel like okay. that's probably the way to go at this point. If they're doing live action, I would really want to see it done like Dick Tracy style. Where it's got that atmosphere, that kind of motif with like the trench coats and the right, but, but all black and white, like black and white with gray. Keep it monotoned. No, don't. So we're talking. We're talking like Werewolf by Night, but uh, like noir. Werewolf by Night, Sin City, Sin City stuff. Yeah, or, yeah. Or okay, that. Sin City. That's a really good. That's a. That's. Wow. I think that's another movie I haven't seen. Or or that really terrible comic adaptation, The Spirit, where it's very posterized, but oh, black and white. That. Oh, don't worry, nobody else did either. But still, uh, keep it in that type of theme. I think it'll be great. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm I'm eager to see what cuz I been we've been hearing about this like we've been hearing whispers about this for mm -hmm. the last couple of years. But now after the strikes are done, we're starting to hear a substantial bit more about them. It looks like they're finally starting to move into pre-production and things like that. So, that's exciting. More Spider-Man is never a bad thing. Now, but... how much of Sony's fingerprints are on it will remain to be seen. But you know what? I have, I have to kind of go back to an old one of the first web line uh, news tits to tidbits. Uh, Bob Iger. He's mm -hmm. just he's just basically Disney's version of Avi Arad. And if you're a Sony Spider-Man fan, <laughs> Avi Arad was terrible with this with the Spider-Man franchise. He is Disney's oh, wow. Avi Arad. You know, the funny thing is, too, because like for me, if you had asked me to list like, you know, the top metatextual Spider-Man foes, you know. Oh, no, uh, no. It's top like, Spider-Man villain of all time. Avi Arad. See, Number one I, villain. <laughs> I wouldn't have I wouldn't have said that. Like, I wouldn't have thought to include him on the list until you said his name just now. And then I'm like, of course, why would I not put him on the list? <laughs> for me, it's Joe Quesada. But. You know, I, I understand that I understand that not everyone is going to share that opinion. So but um, but yeah, like like when you said Avi Arad, like that was, it was like, oh, my God, that's like being called Joe Kassar. Yeah. So, you know, Avi Arad, number one Spider-Man villain. He takes he, mm -hmm. he, he Jojo like J. Jonah Jameson. We've out the way. Avi Arad, biggest villain. 
that's I, I I hadn't thought of that, but that makes a lot of sense. So, all right. Well, moving on, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about Miles Morales here. Um, do you uh do you know that Miles Morales is going to get a three hundred issue of his comic in twenty twenty four? Oh wow. Yeah, it looks like Miles Morales Spider Man number eighteen is going to serve as the milestone issue. And essentially, you know, you know, like they do, like um, you know, Miles has had several different series. Yeah. And yeah. so they're 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 just gonna like give them all, you know, numbers, you know, and add them up and, until yeah. they get to three hundred. And so, um, and apparently this issue is going to feature some of Miles's most uh, iconic villains. I want to get this issue because I want to see who Miles's most iconic villains are. For me, right now, his most iconic villains have been in the movies. Pretty much. Yeah. The, the Prowler and the Spot, you know, and the Spot was a Peter Parker villain, you know, before mm -hmm. this. And now... He has kind of leapt beyond that, and now he's like Miles's biggest villain, in 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 my opinion. In my opinion, I thought his but, biggest villain was his school curfew. He had to be indoors by a certain time, or you get. Oh you well, I mean, you know, they they always they always have those issues. So, but um, yeah, I'm I'm eager to see this. I haven't unfortunately been keeping up with Miles because. Like my box usually is reserved for just like amazing and I can only mm -hmm. afford so much in a given month. But um, I do think that it's really cool that he is getting a 300th issue, like an anniversary issue. And, uh, you know, I'm going to see if I can get my comic shop to at least hold that particular issue for me. So that way I can uh, I can grab it as kind of a, a, a one off purchase, basically. OK, I got gotcha. you. But uh, looking forward to it. I don't know too much other than that, but it was one of those things. It's like, okay, 2024, something to look forward to, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, have you read a lot of Miles's comics? I did in the beginning. So I, I read uh, Miles. I have Mal Miles's origin in his debut issue. Oh, man, I'm so jealous. <laughs> I have that. I Because I, I read Ultimate. I read, I, I bought the first two trades of For Ultimate. Okay. And then jumped in with the single issues where it was Doc Ock's first appearance. And uh, I got the giant Doc Ock. This is back when every Ultimate had two sizes. You had the regular size. And you had like the bigger print size or like the bigger like size. Okay. And uh, that Doc Ock comic I have came in like an Easter basket that was at Walmart. All right. And, and I just wanted the comic. So I bought the Easter basket when it went on clearance just to get the comic, but it was bigger than normal comic size. It was like a magazine size. And uh, that's where that was my jump on point because was reading up Doc Ock introduction to the ultimate universe. And then I jumped in and added ultimate to my box. And so I've got like ultimate Spider-Man, like I think it's like 12 or 13 mm -hmm. all the way through to the end of Parker. And then which transferred over to miles. And I read from miles all the way until I think, it was ultimatum. Uh, yes. Was it ultimatum. Yeah. The end of the ultimate universe type yes. thing where they killed off like half the X-Men and the, everybody, everybody, everybody died except yeah. for miles. Miles. And I think uh, the maker, I think he was called by that point. The like maker, that. it was like miles. You had like dazzler randomly. So it was like all oh, these, I like all these like random heroes and people survived. It was really okay. weird. Wow. Okay. I, I just, uh, I, I didn't even know that. I thought Miles and the Maker and that's it. So we, we had a couple of others though. That's, that's, cool. I think so. Well, no, I didn't get to Battle World. I know Battle World was like the big thing where they like brought the Ultimate Universe to the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Or the, the, yeah. That thing. This was like the event where like Magneto got Mjolnir and like offset the Earth and caused tidal waves and catechisms and all these other things that happened. And like Nightcrawler got killed because he was in the Morlocks tunnels. Uh, who was it? Angel got killed because he tried to save him and got drowned. It was really weird. Like heroes died everywhere. Oh yeah, the Her ultimate line was really good at just viciously killing off people when they wanted to. You know. Yeah. So, but uh, but yeah, it's um, it's it's good to see. It's good to see that Miles, who's 
you know, one of the indisputable holdovers from that uh, that multiverse uh, getting getting his his own title now or right. his I'm sorry, not his own title, his 300th issue of, of, yeah. of his title. That's really cool. So Marvel and Steve Ditko um, went to court recently over the basically over the the copyrights to uh, Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. And now it looks like they have settled mm -hmm. and uh, we don't know the details, but apparently there was an amicable settlement reached between Steve Ditko's estate and Marvel and Marvel will continue to be able to use those two characters in not just their, not just their movies, but also the, the comic books and things like that as well. So, um, now I know that uh, I know that Marvel has not always been kind to its <laughs> creators, sure. Jack Kirby, but um, you know I I don't I have no idea how they treated Steve Ditko and, and from what little I know of Steve Ditko, uh, he was probably like I'm, I'm not going to say he would have cared the least, but I am going to say that that he probably would have had the least to say about it. You know, mm -hmm. he, he probably like, well, he probably gave Marvel the finger and then just kind of walked off in his own direction to do his own thing. Um, yeah. he, he has a very kind of pragmatic and I would say very kind of non-sentimental attitude towards a lot of his past creations. And so um, when he, uh, you know, when he, when he died in 2018, um, I would imagine that his estate, like I would imagine he personally was just like, screw it, whatever, I don't care. But the people running his estate probably were like, OK, we pr probably have more of a vested interest in trying to get paid for this kind of thing than he did. So. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but uh, I know that in the past um, there have been issues with Marvel kind of not really compensating its creators. And I know that, again, when you create something for Marvel, it does not belong to you. It goes to Marvel. It's considered a work for hire. But even so, there's still kind of a baseline as to how you should treat your the people who work for you. And that yeah. should include not just base compensation, but also like you know, at least a little bit of a royalty payment for characters that have very clearly benefited you over the decades, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Do you, do you have any thoughts about this? Ooh, I do. I mean, Marvel, if you create a character for Marvel, you basically end up just having bragging rights. That's pretty yes. much it. You just have bragging rights. Jim Starlin, uh, created for like half the cosmic stuff that's in mm -hmm. Marvel. Uh, you like Guardians of the Galaxy? You like Rock Raccoon? You like all those cosmic characters? Jim Starlin. Not many people know that because does uh, Marvel promote the creators? No, they don't. No. Not really. Uh, unless it's Stanley or Jack Kirby sometimes. Right. Uh, they don't really promote them as people creating them. The only one who's really gone out of his way to make people know that he, has, that he created this character is Rob Liefeld with Deadpool. If yes. he has made it known that he's created that character, I think he took Marvel to court and I think it's something like he has the, um, now if they're releasing anything Deadpool, he oversees it to make sure that he gets his stamp of approval for the character. And so he's really making sure people know that he created Deadpool. And mm -hmm. even at conventions now, if you go see Rob Liefeld, you want to get his autograph on a Deadpool comic, uh, to get graded or whatever, he charges you an additional fee because he created Deadpool. So a normal autograph, which is like maybe 20 bucks from him, now jumps up to 60 plus because it's a number one or it's something, a, a book of value. So it's it's really, you know, becoming, you know, with Marvel that you, you get bragging rights with so those create with those creators, and those creations. I remember Rob Liefeld was definitely not happy with Marvel when they basically made it so that Deadpool was, um, I mean, that, that he was LGBTQ, you know, mm -hmm. 
um, that he was uh, not strictly a, a hetero guy. I, rem- I remember Liefeld had big problems with that. And he there was did. not a thing he could do about <clears throat> it except just growl, you know? I mean, he had no problems with him dating an underage siren, but, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what, what are you, what are you going to do? So, um, but yeah, it's, it's just kind of one of those things. Um, you know, I think probably when I was a teenager, I remember like, I want to work for Marvel. And mm-hmm. now as an adult, I'm like, I'm so glad I never worked <laughs> for Marvel. <laughs> You know, because I mean, you know, not that I've gone off and written novels or created, you know, stuff like that, but like kind of like the idea that if I do something like that, I kind mm-hmm. of have the wherewithal to kind of keep it under my own ownership now. Yes. At least I'd like to think so. So um yeah, glad I never worked for Marvel for that reason. Like the only way at this point, again, and I'm not qualified, so it'll never happen, but like the only way I would ever write for Marvel at this point is if I'm like, okay. All right. I have this great idea for a character and I just, you know, I want to write the first story, Mm -hmm. make that initial splash. And then I just need to walk away, you know, like that's that's pretty much how it has to work, you know, and and um, a lot of creators today, um, you know, hopefully uh, I mean, a lot of creators today are already playing with established characters, so they They know that they don't own them. Um, I would imagine, I can only imagine how difficult it must be to actually create your own character at Marvel and get him into the comics at all, Mm -hmm. much less in some kind of a featured role. So, but um, devil is in the details and you got to keep that in mind when you work with those kinds of, uh, those kind of publishers. So definitely is right. All right. Final news item is um, recently, um, we came across some concept art from Spider-Man No Way Home, which apparently features a team up between Spider-Man and the Vulture that uh, I guess it was scrapped. Like, I think this has been something they had been thinking about doing at the beginning of No Way Home. And then, of course, that just didn't make it into it. I, You know, I kind of like this idea of Peter and 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 Michael Keaton's Vulture like, because at the end of Homecoming, he he does kind of, he does a solid for Peter, you know? He, he does. basically is like, yeah, I have no clue who this guy is. He'd already be dead if I knew, you know? Um, and he very clearly knew. And, it, and so I kind of like the idea of, you know, this, this criminal, this supervillain, whatever you want to call him, um, you know, like kind of doing a 180 and coming around and being either like either an anti-hero or I don't know, maybe he was doing crime and they found an even bigger thing that they needed to work together to do. I I don't know. Um, but mm-hmm. I really like that idea. And I think, um, you know, it would, it, w- it would have been fun to see. I, I understand probably why they scrapped it. You know, you have to, you have to cut your running time down. You have to, you know, you, you probably, they probably saved a chunk of change by not having to hire Michael Keaton back. Yeah, but not going to lie. It would have been would have been pretty cool to see. I don't know your thoughts. That would have been pretty cool. Um, I think people want to see Keaton back as Vulture in a future project. I think that'd be great. Yeah, whether whether it be animated or it be live action. Uh, But if you're going to do cameos and team ups for Spider-Man, my thought process is if you're doing it, it has to mean something later on down the line. And we talked before the show about this a little bit. And Mm -hmm. my thought is this, you know, if we're going to do some like some fantasy booking or some fantasy story writing, I wouldn't choose the vulture. He can appear as like, you know, a shot in the sky or like a a web line of, uh, you know, multiverse type stuff. Right. Um, I wouldn't choose him. If you're going to do a team up that has uh, properties or has uh, storyline content for the future, I bring in Tom Hardy's uh, Venom for a team up. And here's why. And here, here's the main reason why they team up Spider-Man C. I mean, Venom C. Spider-Man do all these do all these other deeds with Andrew Garfield, with Tobey Maguire. He sees all these things happening and Venom's trying to be a hero. He's still trying to be a hero in his own movies. He's more of like the urban right. legend that mm-hmm. maims, eats, kills people. He's trying to have that visage of being a hero. So he works with, Spider- with the Spider-Man. He sees them acting out. He sees what they're doing. He wants to emulate them in his own dimension his own universe, wherever he's from teams up with them. He helps save the day. 
He goes back to his own universe, but he gets inspired. We see him change. And we finally see something happen to Venom that every fan has complained about since the first movie came out. As a tribute to the Spider-Man, as a tribute to Spider-Man, we see a white spider form on his front and on his back of his costume. Finally bringing the classic comic book style to the film. Because we don't have that. That that's not what the movie Venoms have, but that yes. but that's look but that's not only establishing something in that Spider-Man movie, but then that establishes it to that character going forward with the White Spider that he can do going forward without Peter Parker again. Now that he's got the White Spider, we have that we have that imagery in the movies, but that's just my fantasy storytelling. I mean, I like it, though. I like it. You know, it's funny. Um, when I watched No Way Home, um, I, I haven't reviewed that one for an episode yet, and, and it'll be a, a little while before I do. But, mm -hmm. you know, No Way Home was very unique in what it was able to deliver to audiences. Um, no Way Home was very kind of it, it, it was metatextual in a lot it of was. ways. It, it was, was very aware of what had come before and you know how to how to weave all that in and i have this I, I i've always had this issue with the venom movies i think on by themselves if they weren't called venom i would be fine with them i'd be like yes it's a fairly entertaining you know superhero slash sci-fi flick it's got a lot of good scenes i like mm -hmm. the characters but there's no spider-man is like seminal to venom's origin you know he is and so I feel like with that approach in a, in in like a third Venom movie, which we will be getting one in 2024. So they're mm -hmm. I think they're already doing whatever they're going to do. But like that would have the same effect that, say, No Way Home had in terms of getting me to <clears throat> like forgive uh, Spider-Man or the Amazing Spider-Man 2, where, yeah. you know, because I, I, have, I have so many issues with that movie. but like it it gave it gave Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker a big redemption that I felt was just needed. Did, and and I feel like I feel like kind of what you're talking about here would be a really good step towards, you know, Sony getting a lot of fans to kind of like forgive the the, yes. the first Venom movie, you know, because again, not a bad movie, always gonna have an issue with it because no Spider-Man yeah. at the origin, you know, and even and Venom so, too, even mm -hmm. Venom Part Two. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, how are you going to have a movie called Maximum Carnage and a VPG thirteen? <laughs> you you can't. You, you really, if you read Ultimate Spider-Man or Spider-Man Unlimited Number One, where that was the intro to Maximum Carnage, people were getting murdered left and right in that issue. Yep. And that was the first issue. That was the very first issue. Yep. And we had Carnage. And people were getting like censor killed, I guess, is a way to yeah. call it. Yeah. Uh, off screen killed, censor killed. Yeah. You uh, knew what was happening, but you didn't actually see it. You don't. Yeah. You don't see it. Mm -hmm. So it, it just, that would be a, a, a help to that franchise because. I hate reboots. I hate remakes. I hate retakes. DC has their own issues right now that they're going to, that they're going to do reboots and remakes with them. Don't really want to see that done with Marvel. They, they, they have a good track. You have good stories. You have bad stories. You have good movies. Right. You have bad movies, right? It's all opinion. I don't want to see Venom get rebooted again. Uh, not, not at least for 15 years. Give, give, give me time to grow old and forget the other movies. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that. I've heard that this is Tom Hardy's last Venom project too. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how true that is, but that's well, what I've been hearing. Well, it was a good run. <laughs> Not really, but it, it happened. It was an all right run. He was, was a better Eddie run. Brock than Topher Grace. I'm sorry to say. You know what? For a few years now, I forgot that Topher Grace was Eddie Brock. Now. I'm reminded that he is or was. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry. It's all good. 
All right. But yeah, no, I, I, I get what you're saying. So, um, but, uh, yeah. Um, you know, team ups are, team ups are always fun and they're always fun in the movies. So hopefully at some point, uh, we will just keep getting them forever and ever and ever. Right. Yes. Forever. <laughs> All right, and that's all the Spidey news for this week. Now, let's move on to our feature segment, a Spidey Reads installment featuring some of our favorite Spider-Man holiday stories. Okay, all right. Um, I've been I've been really looking forward to this one. So. <laughs> There's something wonderful about a well-made holiday special, particularly when it's featuring a specific genre. I've read a few superhero holiday specials, and I'm sure we've both seen our fair share of shows, movies, and other media that feature superheroes and the holidays. Mm -hmm. Some stories are touching, some are humorous, some are action-packed, but all have the goal of pointing up the importance of taking stock of the holidays and trying to be there for others when they need you. Aaron, before we get into this discussion about our favorite Spidey stories for the holidays, I'd like to ask you, what do the holidays mean to you and what role do you envision the superhero genre, comics, cartoons, movies, etc., uh, playing when it, doves that, when it dovetails with them? Ooh, well, for the superhero in the comic book genre with the holiday season, it's all about the atmosphere. You have to have snow. That that apparently that's that that that's a checklist thing. You have to have snow. You Man, have to you have the colors. Have holiday, you can't have holiday stories in Texas. Dang. You cannot. They tried that with Scarlet Spider. It didn't work out. You have to have the colors red and green. They are vibrant. You have to have traditional city shots. Of like a snow draped city with lights everywhere at night. Apparently during the day is a big no no. It's always usually at night when they have those little city splash right. pages. Mm -hmm. um, and there always has to be somewhere in the comic a Santa on the street corner ringing a bell, collecting loose change <laughs> for charity. There, it's always in every comic for the holidays. It it, it happens. Uh, it's just what it is. Uh, and, then, and then you have to have somehow the characters wearing the most extravagant winter clothing that they own to go to the store. So they have their beanies, their scarves, their puffy jackets that are made for the Sahara Desert and in, in the North Pole. Right. Their winter pants, their, their uh, hiking boots, all of that. Just, just to go out on a on a walk on the street. That's what the holidays happen have in comics for me. That's fair. That's fair. No, um, there's definitely a kind of prescribed look and feel to a lot of them. Um, and uh, as we as we kind of delve into some of these Spidey centric holiday stories, I think we'll find that for the most part, a lot of that is maintained. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I, I also like the idea that um, not all of not all of these things need to be hewed to. And uh, hopefully we'll get into that as we get further into these stories. Now, let's get down to the <laughs> Christmas turducken. Uh, we've each got a list of stories that have had an impact on us as Spider-Man or Spidey adjacent readers around the holidays. Aaron, as my guest, you get to go first. Which Spidey story brought out the holiday spirit in you? You know, part of the holidays is bringing family and friends together. Yeah, Nothing says coming together like a Marvel team up. But not just any Marvel team up. It has to have Spider-Man. has to have Christmas. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking of family, there's no bigger family or better family than the Fantastic Four. Uh, but not just any member of the Fantastic Four. No, you know, uh -huh. you're, you're not get, you're not getting you know the motherly, invisible woman. You're not getting the smart, 
uh, Mr. Fantastic. You're not getting that big old crazy uncle, uh, the thing, Ben Grimm. No, you're getting Johnny. The resident and hothead. The resident hothead. The resident jock, if you would even say that. The high school jock type of character. And Sp it's Spider-Man and it's he the Human Torch fighting the Sandman because of his interruption of a polar bear club on the beaches of New York <laughs> or Jersey. Wait, wait, the polar bear club now, is that where they like a bunch of people like run out into the water because it's cold, right? Apparently so. Yes, Normally they're, they're supposed to they're supposed to jump into the water. They they like yeah. they, they find a frozen lake and they, they set up a ring around the, to prevent undertow and you jump into the ice water. I guess for Spider Man, I guess in the Marvel Universe, if you run into the water that's freezing, which you know, depending on how the beach is, if it's low tide or high tide. You're either running a few feet or you're running a half mile to get to chest level water. And because okay. it's Jersey or New York, they're running. And so, and the Sandman interrupts that for his own personal gain. So. And uh, so Spidey had to stop him and the, 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 w w did the torch just happen to fly by or were they hanging out? What, what was going on? Well, Spider-Man decided that because Sandman is predominantly a Fantastic Four villain, he goes to the Baxter building to try to find help for him dealing with Sandman only to find <laughs> that Johnny Storm, like Macaulay Culkin is home alone. <laughs> and so I had to ask him for, for help. Oh, to, I love it. To, to to help him capture and to help him uh, break Sandman's uh, evil plans, nefarious plans, uh, which in reality is basically he just wanted to visit his mom in her apartment. Oh. That's it. That's it? He just wanted to visit his mom? He broke out of prison to visit, the sick, to visit, the six, to visit his sick mother in her apartment for Christmas. Did they let him? They let him, and then he escaped. Of course he did. Okay. He escaped All down right. the drain in her apartment. That just, that, 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 that is, mwah, that, that is perfect Sandman right there. So. Pretty much. So it's, okay. like a, it's like a Harold and Kumar go to Sandman's. So. Did you enjoy this story, or how, how did you find it? I had to remember that this story came out in the 70s, like early 70s. Okay. Uh, for some of the jokes and some of the lingo. and. Uh, why they let that happen at the end? Like, why didn't Spider-Man just like kind of web up the drain? You know, throw some tissue paper in the drain so he couldn't escape. You know, clog them drains up. But no, uh, it's '70s greatness in its wow. finest. It's just okay. '70s greatness. And All you right. have, and you have a. I think it's either a debut or a cameo by Misty Knight in there as well. Oh so. really? Oh okay, cool. That's, so that's, I forget that's if it's really... a cameo or forget if it's a debut, but Misty Knight is in there. So okay, very nice, very nice. No, I uh, I, I have not read that one, and I um I I've seen it on a lot of lists of like mm -hmm. best Spider-Man holiday stories. So it's one of those that I'm going to get around to reading eventually. But uh, I I I love your I love your summary <laughs> of it. That's that that's great. So pretty much, All right. Okay, well, um, I guess I guess I'll go next. And um, for me, I'm going to try to do these in chronological order by by publication date. So the first one of these is also from the '70s, from 1977. Um, oh wow! <laughs> co coincidentally, the year I was born. So, um, but it is I, I love the title for this one. It is called. War of the Reptile Men, which is that that sounds exactly like a holiday story, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does. It's, Roger Corman made it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what? Totally would totally would buy that. But um, that that is the title of this issue of Amazing Spider-Man number 166. And. I hadn't read the issue that came before it, but apparently Spider-Man had been in some kind of conflict with Stegron, who is like, mm -hmm. you know, this dude who like turns into this orange dinosaur lizard looking kind of thing. 
and is like, you know, I need to take him down or he's going to try to like, I think, I think he like, I think he robbed like fossils from a museum. And I think he was going to like resurrect the dinosaurs with some kind of weird ray that I think he and I think maybe Kurt Connors had invented. I, I don't know. And yeah, apparently this guy was also Kurt Connors' lab assistant. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the reason that's relevant is that Spider-Man is actually going to Kurt Connors' place to uh, try to get his help and be like, okay, you know, and as soon as he gets to the window, the lizard comes out the window and is like, you, you know, and they start fighting and everything. <laughs> and and Spidey's like, dude, whoa, what's going on? And lizard's like, you know, Connors, you know, lab assistant turned Stagron is doing a thing and I have to, I have to protect the, the, the mammals family from him or something. And so I'm going to go after him and stay out of my way or I'll mm-hmm. tear you limb from limb. And, you know, Peter goes and checks on, uh, his, uh, Kurt's wife. I can't, I can't remember her name. I know his son's name is Billy. Is his wife, is his wife's name Martha? I, I don't remember. Anyways, is it Martha? It I, might I, be Martha. It might be. I, I can't remember. Anyways, and she's trying to hold it together, but she cl- very clearly is having difficulty. And so Peter's like, don't worry. I'm going to go rescue him. I'm going to make sure that he is home in time for Christmas. Cause she's like, she's trimming the tree. She's trying to go through the motions and keep things as normal as possible. So he goes into the sewers because that's where the, that's where the lizard went mm-hmm. and basically comes upon, um, the lizard and Stegron fighting Stegron is able to use like this. It's like, I think, I think it was like a gun or something that shot this magic laser beam that turned the, the dinosaur fossils into fully fleshed dinosaurs. And he sent them up to the surface to attack everybody. Mm-hmm. While all this is going on, Peter has getting, getting a call from MJ basically going, Hey, daddy O or whatever lingo they're talking back then. She's like, Hey, you're missing Harry and Flash's Christmas party. Where are you? And Peter's like, I'm sorry. I'm busy. I can't do it at this point. I don't think, I don't think, uh, readers are aware that Mary Jane knows that he's Spider-Man and, you know, she probably doesn't yet at that point because they hadn't written in that retcon yet, you know, Mm -hmm. but like, that's kind of all there, all of that scene that you see. You get back up to the because because you know the two lizard people fighting. Yeah, Spider Man's trying to keep them apart, and eventually, um, it, things get uh, things get back to the surface where the dinosaurs are. <laughs> the dinosaurs are attacking basically, <laughs> and you know it's just kind of like wowzers you know we've we've got spidey trying to take on the lizard trying to take on stegron and then trying to save civilians from like a triceratops and a brontosaurus and a and a a t-rex that are all like you know just on the rampage and i don't remember how everything played out but eventually you know i think the i think the dinosaurs started to basically revert to fossils um, on their own because there was that effect was only going to last for so long. Okay. Stegron's plans fell apart. And then Peter managed to very cleverly, I thought this was pretty cool. He managed to inject some lizard formula into his webbing so that when the lizard taunted him, Peter just shot him in the mouth. And, <laughs> and then he started to turn back into Kurt Connors. Never mind that your that stuff is supposed to make you asphyxiate and choke to death. Yeah. Apparently that's not a problem here. So I think Stagron runs off. Kurt Connors is Kurt Connors again. And so Peter or Spider-Man takes him home. And basically the issue ends with Peter kind of looking through the Connors family window at Kurt and Billy and Martha, I'm going to assume her name Mm -hmm. is. And they're all spending Christmas together. And that, that happened because Peter basically kind of like dove into action and, and helped out a family that needed it on Christmas Eve. And that's, that's where the story ends. So, um, you know, I mean, it's, 
it's technically a holiday story. You know, it yeah, does occur during the holiday season. It just involves wizard men. <laughs> you know? so, technically. Okay. So, yeah. Right. Um, you haven't read this one, have you? I have not read that one. I have okay. not. But Definitely. if it's got Stegron in it, I've got to read that because it's, yeah. I enjoy Stegron as basically Marvel's attempt at uh, having dinosaur people coming <laughs> in. Uh, I mean, we got Sauron with the X-Men, but more dinosaur people is fun. It's funny because I remember reading, I, th I think this was, was uh, a Spider-Man in the X-Men comic, where he, he encounters Sauron. And mm -hmm. and tells him he's like Lycos, like you've got the ability to rewrite DNA on the fly. You could cure cancer with that kind of tech. And and Sauron responded. It, uh, it, this was like one of the most Sauron things I've ever read, where it's like, "But I don't want to cure cancer. I want to turn people into dinosaurs." <laughs> I'm like, wow. I think that, I have that issue. Yeah, and that, that seems to be just the theme with spider-man and any lizard based foe that he attacked that he no used. no that was no that was it was black cat and puma because he turned uh -huh. black cat into a cat like like into like a giant <laughs> like wear cat person okay and so boom this is when puma and black cat were dating in the comic series for a right, brief right. minute uh and he's like why are you turning people into their animal instincts like but also turning people into dinosaurs you can cure cancer uh -huh. why don't you cure cancer and he's like, I don't want to do that. I want to turn people into dinosaurs. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, I get where it's coming <laughs> from there, you know, but still it was just uh, it was just one of those things where I was like, oh, that was really funny. But yeah. Um, so uh, War of the Reptile Men. Uh, <laughs> this is a this is a holiday story that I got a lot of enjoyment out of. So um, definitely, definitely worth a read. Uh, Aaron, <laughs> what's your next story? Uh, my next one probably has the most recognizable cover um not only because of who they're imitating with mm -hmm. the art on it okay uh, but because of they really overcomplicated an issue to set up for something else like like i, I would say right. this is this is like a middle issue that's a continuation of a story that they had to crank out for december for this, for uh for christmas and that they kind of went overboard with everything that's happening okay but my, but mainly the cover is what gets people's attention and i'm talking about peter parker the spectacular spider-man number 112 and okay. the cover on it if you're a fan of action movies especially the movie cobra uh <laughs> you, you know that sylvester stallone's in that movie yes this is basically sylvester stallone illustrated as santa holding a gun having Cobra sunglasses and smoking a cigarette. I, I have seen this picture used on a lot of lists of Spider-Man holiday stories. So, so is this about like a corrupt Santa, like mall Santa or something? Or so what? there's several different stories that happen in this one issue. Okay. So it starts off with a, basically a, a gift thief or a kid uh, steals presents from a lady who gives the excuse that it, that they're for his sick mom, another sick mother, Christmas time, sick mothers all around. Right. Um, and Spider-Man catches the kid. Kid gives a story to Spider-Man. Spider-Man's not buying it. The woman is feeling emotional, so she says drop charges. Then the kid steals her watch. And it gets away. <laughs> Again, proving Spider-Man right. Um, he gets away, but they're chasing it. But Spider-Man's chasing after the kid. Then there's a Santa Claus that's been kidnapped and uh, uh, hogtied and thrown in a closet. So you have a imposter Santa robbing people and giving toys for charity away to other uh, people. Okay. Um, which involves imposter Santa breaking into a neighbor's house where Spider-Man breaks in and accidentally webs up the wrong person who gets chastised for doing that. Everything's going wrong. He eventually finds the Santa at the end, but we find out that that was the, the another Santa that was it. It's random. It's hard to explain because there's so many twists in this story that you kind of get lost with what's going on. Okay. Um, and then it even ends on a cliffhanger for another story. So it ends with like basically people in the bushes watching MJ through a window with knives saying, 
oh, we'll take care of them later on. Not, we won't do it today, we'll do it later on. So it's really weird. But the cover is very, people use the cover for everything. I've seen people use this cover for their Christmas profiles, for like their, uh, their avatar profiles for during the holiday season. I've had people use it as a way to say, let's make a Rambo 5 during the holiday season. It's a very random story. Um, and this this image is of the fake Santa, right? As of the fake of imposter okay. Santa okay. holding holding a gat, smoking a cig- cigarette, with with the cobra shade sunglasses shades on. Yeah, I know exactly which image you're talking about. Yes, no, I I, I get it, I get it. Um, o- overall, what wh- what are your thoughts on this story? My thoughts on the story are, are are a why did I read this? B, <laughs> the cover has not much to do with the actual story itself. Okay. Because the story, because basically the story is about Spider Man making all these mistakes, getting chastised for his mistakes, for, you know, letting a crook go, uh, webbing the wrong person with a potential break in, right? Uh, not stopping the person in time. Uh, it's a lot of bumbling on Spider-Man's part. So it's just a cover. I'm not going to lie. The cover got me. Okay. That's the fair. Cover. Never judge a book by its cover, except for this one, <laughs> except for this one. So you're saying the cover, the cover alone is like the only real redeeming feature. Pretty much. Pretty okay. Much so. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Hey, you know, they, they, they can't all be winners, right? They cannot. There, there are great stories that have amazing covers. Then there are other stories that are not great that have great covers. Mm-hmm. This is the latter. Okay. This is the latter. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. If, 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 if uh, Hasbro made it a Marvel legend of imposter Santa, I would probably buy that figure. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I would buy it. <laughs> but this, but this, this comic is bad, <laughs> but okay. it's, but, but the cover is very, um, it's very memorable. Well, I mean, I, I like, again, that's another story that I do intend to read at some point simply just because that image is very yeah. striking, you know? So I, I, I get where you're coming from. So I will, I will go into it with somewhat lowered expectations. So, <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, for, for my uh, <clears throat> for my next story, um, <laughs> uh, the next story is another amazing Spider-Man issue. It's actually issue number three fourteen, and the story is titled "Down and Out in Forest Hills." Now, this story takes place when Peter and MJ are now married, and mm-hmm. they come home on Christmas Eve. And essentially find that they have been evicted from their apartment. Now, I think if the if if I got all of the context correctly, the person that's doing the evicting was some like former landlord in the sense that he still owns the place, but I think he's like in prison at the moment okay. because he was this he was this dude who, um, I guess he like. I, maybe he had some influence on MJ's career or something and was basically trying to kind of like, you know, manipulate her and basically basically claim ownership of her. And they managed to like, it seems like they managed to thwart this. He got thrown in jail, but he still owned the property. So um, they come home on Christmas Eve and his handler, some very sleazily drawn and written lawyer type, is mm-hmm. just basically like here, Merry Christmas, you gotta leave. And so they don't have a choice, they just they have to go. And so Peter is pretty upset about this, partially because this dude is very clearly just trying to get back at MJ. And then yeah. also because they don't really have anywhere to go. And Aunt May offers and Peter refuses. And essentially, um, before he can really, like, before he and MJ can really talk out why, um, Spider-Man business comes up. And I don't remember what, but he had to go and help somebody who needed an immediate rescue. 
And it's like, it, it was kind of like Peter being, ah, oh, God, damn, this costume is interfering with my life, you know, kind of thing. So he goes and he does his thing. He makes someone's day very happy. And they're like, thank you very much. There's another subplot with some rich mogul who has worked as assistant for the last 23 years on mm -hmm. Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And that guy uh, is apparently going to retire soon. And, you know, he's very clearly irked with his boss. Um, he's he's planning to like he's planning to like shoot him, basically. Yeah. And so like Peter gets involved with that and has to figure that out. And between all of these things, he manages to go to Flash. Um, he finds Flash at the gym and is like, hey, can MJ and I stay with you? And he's like, <laughs> well, here's the thing, Peter. I kind of not living in an apartment right now. I've been staying in the gym, um, you know, just like I've, I've been living kind of in the back room for for a little while and this is just kind of my situation mm -hmm. he's like if you if if mj's cool with it then you guys are welcome i i will give you whatever i have you know and peter is just like god damn like flash is not exactly doing well either and he's just offering up whatever he has like yeah that's ridiculously generous and you know and and he's trying to you know he's he's trying to basically find um a way to to be a little bit more sympathetic compassionate and just maybe forgiving um in in the face of of all the people that he's helping and maybe the the generosity of those around him and finally he comes to the conclusion like by the end when he gets to talk to mj again he's like look here's why I don't want to go back to aunt may's like when i moved out that was me finally getting my independence and I feel like if I go back at this point that life is telling me that I've lost and that I'm a loser. And that's mm -hmm. very difficult for me to kind of like kind of swallow my pride and, and admit that. Um, but he comes to realize that it's not just about him anymore. It's also about MJ. And to some degree, it's also about Aunt May, who would be mm -hmm. just over the moon to have her nephew back. And so he eventually says, you know, OK, I'd like to take you up on your offer to come back. And so that's kind of how it ends. You know, they'll eventually find another place, but in the meantime, May has got her family back for the holidays. And so she is very happy and, you know, so is MJ. And if you've got a happy MJ, yeah. you've hopefully got a happy Peter. So, you know, <laughs> um, it's it, true. It, it, it was a good story. Uh, you, you, have you read this one? I have not. I have okay. not, it's, uh, it's but it sounds single... like something I would read. It's something. It sounds like something I would want to read. Yeah, it's it's a single issue, and I don't remember. I I think it's Todd Todd McFarlane doing the art, and sounds uh, like it. and David Michelinie is doing the writing at this time, and um, it's it's a fairly good like you know again you're looking for like like I don't know when you hear the term holiday special I think of those mid 80s the spinning kind of light tv <laughs> yeah. ads like i feel like this is a story that would really fit that that particular milieu i don't know if that's the right word but it would fit that pretty well and so it's okay. it's 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 like um kind of like i don't know have you seen the guardians of the galaxy holiday special yes i did i watched that last year it was that's fun. a very <laughs> Yeah, it's very it's fun. a very it's a very Guardians show, but it's also a very holiday show, and so I feel like this is okay. one story that that fits that uh, <clears throat> it fits that bill very well. So okay, wow, that so so like well, was this issue? It sounds very if it sounds very uh, it's a wonderful life with people in need coming out uh, and looking for help, and you have people, their friends, and sometimes former adversaries former rivals coming to their aid yeah yeah so. it's 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 a it's a good one and i mean you know it was kind of one of those that you know that it warmed my cockles in a good way you know like um <laughs> you know like like I, I walked away from the stegron story pretty pretty <laughs> happy too but i would say for pretty different reasons you know so um, but the, this one, this one was good. I, I, I do recommend it. So, okay. Oh, that's, that's good. I'll have to check that one out. I'll yeah. No, one out. Uh, amazing Spider-Man number three fourteen. So that's pretty good. Yeah.
So I All guess right. it's my turn. Yeah. Next up. So coming out in December of 1990, I got the Spectacular Spider-Man number 173. Okay. Now, again, somehow I picked comics. They either have very misleading covers, good covers of bad stories, mm -hmm. or a mixture of both. This issue has a very misleading cover. Okay. You see the cover, you're thinking, okay, this is, this is what's going to happen. Something's about to go down. On the cover, you've got the 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 May Aunt May house, you know, right. again covered in snow. There's snow everywhere. Door is open. You got an MJ running out to to try to see what the commotion is about to try to uh -huh. save somebody, and you got Doctor Octopus standing there strangling Spider Man with his metal arms. Oh wow, <laughs> that so does sound, that does sound like pretty cool. So so you're thinking, okay, this is this is a Spider Man versus Doc Ock story. Right, that's you. You have them fighting yeah. out in the front of Aunt May's house yeah. with, a, with MJ running to looks like to Sp Spider Man's defense. This this sounds this sounds like a good setup. So yeah. so so here's the setup. So these these three guys, these three thugs, are on the beach. This giant metal orb comes up out of the water. They see it. What do you think your first thought would be if you saw a metal orb or metal ship boat thing come out of the water? What, what, what would your first thought be? I mean, I'm thinking some mad scientist somewhere is going to try to, like, uh, you know, bomb Spider-Man's aunt's place or something. So, so the thought of, you know, seeing something come out of the beach is that not like, you know what? There's probably a pilot inside. Let's go rob him. Let's go break the door open to that thing and let's go rob the pilot. What? Exactly. <laughs> so these thugs try to break open the door. Door shoots open. Metal arms come out. Snaps all their necks. Wow. Doc Ock walks off the beach. Metal orb goes back into the water and Doc Ock gets into a limousine. Next scene. <laughs> Next scene. Spider-Man's getting coming to the annual Daily Bugle Christmas party. Uh -huh. Sees a couple of guys hassling, insert charity Santa Claus, okay. collecting donations. All he's, right. He's getting harassed by these by these kids, by these guys. Spider-Man swings them down to help Santa out. And this is the this is during the time whenever Venom is off playing semi-hero in San Francisco. Right. Yeah. So, what does Marvel do? Well, we got to have backup Brock. We got to have a backup Brock. Enter in Nick Katzenberg, who is basically. Oh, God. Yeah. Brock, uh, Eddie Brock ordered from Wish. Comes in, takes pictures of Spider Man confronting these guys, spins it as him beating up pedestrians and harassing Charity Santa. Goes to the Christmas party, starts making lewd comments about MJ. Parker loses his he loses his temper. Right. Be beats this guy up, pulls, you know, the you know, every Christmas party you have the fight that breaks out between the guy who makes jokes and the guy who has had enough. Classic trope. That is a trope. Yeah, it is. It happens here. Spider-Man. <laughs> Or Parker loses his he, he he loses his temper, beats this kid up or beats this guy up, um, leaves the party, very angry, and it goes with him basically swimming through the city, uh, angry. Enter him back at the May house. May is with MJ was with her current boyfriend. You, you remember Willie Lumpkins? Remember him? Oh man, I remember the name at least. Oh, yeah. oh, so basically, yeah. So basically, Willie Lumpkin. Uh, basically he was the old man that Aunt May dated. That was kind of like, um, the homeless guy that is now has a home, but he doesn't know what to do because he's never had a home before. He hasn't had open a home in a long time, but the way they're writ, but the way that Willie Lumpkin was written as he was written as kind of like a, um, Oh, 
an earnest type character, but without the earnest charm. You know, oh, Ernest. Boy. Like okay. Ernest scared stupid. Ernest saves Christmas. Ernest goes to camp. Right. Imagine, yeah. imagine that character, but without the charm, without without the go get him attitude. Oh boy. Without, um, with, with, like, without the uh, without the perseverance, and without the the troll love song album on vinyl. Right. Right. That's that's Willie Lumpkin. Oh man. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> it goes with them basically talking about being a family being with this and this and this cut back to now spider-man swinging home to may's house to go to their christmas party mm -hmm. and he as he's swinging around the house he sees a limousine in front of his aunt's his aunt's house and he sees a dr octopus peering in through the windows he jumps down huh. he wants to tangle but all Otto wants to do is just see what may is doing there's really no fight. There is really no strangulation of metal arms around a Spider-Man's neck. It is just Otto coming to realize that May is no longer into him and she has moved on. Wow. That's so he leaves. a lot of stuff going on for that. That, yeah, is for, for that cover, you know, or that cover. It is a great piece of cover art because mm -hmm. you have Otto wearing the suit. He's not wearing his green and gold potato suit. He's wearing like a nice business suit with his arms strangling, you know, Spider-Man on the cover. And then you read the story and it's like, why didn't they just show Spider-Man beating up uh, Charity Santa Clauses instead? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. You know, those, those won't sell as many covers. I don't know. They I... won't. They, they probably won't. They probably but, won't. So, so do he and Octavius just talk or what? Pretty much. Octavius is like, you know what? He had a picture of May uh, that he had, I guess, uh, whenever they were an item for that right. that storyline. Uh, that was, oh, wow. But he has a picture of Aunt May. He's got him feelings. He's wondering how she's doing. And he's peeping into the window to see that she's moved on. And that's pretty much it. Okay. All right. I mean, it sounds very sad. It also sounds extremely convoluted. It does. I mean, it, 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 it sounds to me like the emotional center is all about Doc, but he's barely featured. You he's know? in the beginning. He's at the end. That's kind of it. <laughs> he's like the um, background story for this issue. Okay. All right. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, which, which comic was this again? This was Spectac Spectacular Spider-Man number 173. Okay. All right. I'm again, I may I may have to chase these down and read them just just it, for If just you look at if you look at the cover, the cover is like, the cover is great. But <laughs> story not so much. That's fair. That is fair. And again, they can't all be winners, I guess, you know. They cannot. Sorry, my uh, my executive producer trouble is climbing over things and knocking stuff over. Hey, hey, just say bye, Felicia. That's you. Don't. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, <laughs> did you have anything more you wanted to say about this issue, or that was it? That was okay. it. Okay. All right. And was that your final one? That was my final one. Okay. That was my final All right. One. Okay. For my final issue. Um, this one is from the year 2012. It is a mere 11 years ago. And this wow. one, I don't know, you, you, you might say I'm cheating a little bit here, but <laughs> this one is from the Scarlet Spider. This is from Kane's run when he was in Houston. Uh, I just I just want to say, first of all, I just want to say that I loved this series. I loved I loved uh, the artwork, especially when Ryan Stegman was on it. Yes. Um, I liked the I liked the initial stories. I liked the uh, they had the, they had storyline. They had a storyline featuring Craven. Uh, mm -hmm. There was there was carnage going on. There was all kinds of stuff going so on. So I, I have to I have to ask about this because this was this was a big deal whenever. Since we both live in the Houston area, this mm -hmm. was a big deal about Houston getting a Spider-Man. Yeah. 
and Al- and Alamo Draft House had this big thing where they had Stegman, and uh, and they had the writer who was writing it uh, at the Alamo. Yost, yeah, yeah, Yost at Alamo for like a big Q and A kind of like a release party thing that they mm-hmm. did this big event. Did you go to that? I wish. No, I didn't. I I went to that, and I sat. I think second or third row from the stage and if you go to alamo draft house you can order food you can do that that's part of the yes. experience yes well i ordered cheese i ordered mozzarella sticks and french fries and as i'm eating them listening to them talk stegman kept looking over at my plate like he get, i could tell he's getting hungry <laughs> during your thing and he keeps looking over and i you know during their thing i asked him I said do you want some like in the middle of their q and or like their their time there he's like do you want one and he's like he like quickly shakes his head no and goes back to talking but he kept looking over at me <laughs> as i'm eating and i felt really uncomfortable with that but i just remember that that was the thing that that he that he kept doing um but also at that show it was funny because stegman was like when we were playing this story out we didn't realize that there were not a lot of tall buildings in Houston for him to swing on. And that traffic is very, very annoying for this city. Yes. And they had to incorporate, and they incorporated that into the storyline for that series, which was great because it's it's a Houston thing. It's a big Houston thing. It is. And I mean, like, I remember, I think I was reading the first issue of Scarlet spider. We're, 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 we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna diverge for a little bit here. Yeah. I was reading the first issue of Scarlet Spider, and one of my favorite lines from that entire run <laughs> is Kane just on his back on the roof of a building skyscraper or wherever he is. <laughs> and it is summer and it is in Houston and it is hot. And he is like, Oh my God, it's hot. Oh my God, I'm sweating. Oh my God, my sweat is sweating. And Did I was like, be? I was like, Yep, yep. I, I, I've, I have, I've had exactly that mindset before. So, but (laughs) so from this glorious, this, I think, I think this, uh, I think this series lasted about 20, 21 issues, something like that. I was real sad to see it go. Yeah. But, um, from this glorious little run, we got, I think it was an issue, what was it, number? Yeah, it was issue number 12. We got the story, The Man in the Presidential Suite, All right? <laughs> here's, here's why I had to include this, okay? If you think Die Hard is a Christmas movie, then you need to read this comic, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because... A bunch of, uh, I don't remember if they're terrorists or just criminals. They basically, um, they basically attack the, uh, like they, they take the, what is it? The, the hotel that Kane is staying at. They take it hostage. Yes. Like they, 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 they hold it up. And again, a bunch of guys in Santa Claus suits and, uh, and it's just like, Hmm, I wonder, I wonder what the other piece of, media property they might be pulling from uh, inspiration from here. Okay. And the, they're, they're looking, I, they, they are looking for money. They, they are, they are robbing people. They're like, give us, give us your valuables. And, um, Kane's like, Kane has just had some kind of an issue with carnage. And so he is up in his room and he has gotten drunk. And he is just, I think he's got a hangover at this point. And all of his friends, because, you know, every superhero, they've got like a little group of support friends with them. They do. And they're like, uh, you need to sober up because um, the building is is under siege. And Kane is just like, I don't care. I, you know, and 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 finally, the um, I don't I don't remember that. I don't remember the kind of it was kind of his love interest, but kind of not. I, I don't know. She had red hair. She was a, she's very clearly a Mary Jane analog, you know, and really? like she's working down there when all of this happens. And so they're, they're just sitting here trying to round up people for their money and everything. And finally she's like, you know, if you're looking for a big score, 
what are you doing down here? I know a guy who's got lots of money, more, you know, more than you could ever shake a stick at. And they guys like, oh, yeah, where is this? Where, you know, where is this rich person? She says, it's you want the man in the presidential suite. And that's where Kane is staying. <laughs> and, so, and so basically Kane is finally able to sober up. And then it just becomes Kane versus a bunch of Santa Claus terrorists, basically. <laughs> and it's just it's just him laying the smack down once it once he's finally gotten over himself and and. and you know, gotten sober. It it is just him. Just you know, I I think uh, I think the iconic line of that issue is him standing over a um a terrorist, and he's holding him up. Looks like he's Santa, and he's just looking at the he's he's looking at the reader, and he's like, "Anybody else wants some Christmas spirit?" And I was, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "How can you not love this?" You know. So that's true. So yeah, for me again. I'm one of those people, you know, not, not everyone agrees with me. I'm one of those people that I think Die Hard is a Christmas movie. I, think I do too. Perfectly fair. And so I was just tickled when I read this issue. I was like, this, this is, this is great. This is exactly what I needed for the holidays. This is mindless. <laughs> it's fun. And it's Hayden Parker doing John McClane. I don't think you could ask for more. <laughs> so That is true. That is very much true. So, um, so yeah, um, I don't know. Have you, have you read this one? It sounds, it sounds very familiar. So I probably have. Um, Okay. But the girl you're talking about wasn't, I don't think she was his love interest. I think she was just like this, the kid sidekick because she had the flame power. She had like the fire powers. The, the Araceli. Yeah. Yeah. Araceli. Yeah. yeah, She did. um, I, I don't, I'm having a hard time remembering the, the other girl's role though but like you know it like i don't think there was ever anything between them but i think there was kind of like maybe there could be but yeah it never never really happened yeah like like, yeah it it never bloomed it just was hinted but never never went off on that but i do remember that um because when you said the santa gang i'm like oh okay that's starting to pop in my mind member bears are blooming uh, right yeah and I, I i'm recalling that yeah uh, no that that was just that was such a fun holiday read um and again it's just it's a holiday read in the most technical sense of the term true but it 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 does work it does work so but uh yeah um i i don't know i i enjoyed all of my holiday reads it sounded it sounded like yours like you one of them was pretty good and the other two were like not as good as yeah we well hope, it's so. more like one was really good uh-huh. one had so much in between story that if it didn't have the issue before it or the issue after it you're kind of like where does it go like what right. happens you're kind okay. of lost and the other one was very deceiving with okay you're thinking you're going to get a doc Ock fight on christmas and you don't man <laughs> and you don't Man, like I feel robbed and I haven't even read this. Yeah. Story, so because I kind of want that now. I want a Doc Ock fight on Christmas, yeah. you know, you, you do. You definitely do. That. Yeah. So. All right. But yeah, um, I, I, I feel like this has been a pretty good, um, pretty good roundup of, of Spider-Man holiday stories. I'm definitely mm-hmm. going to look for the ones that you have mentioned. Uh, some of them were already on my radar, so I definitely want to want to get. Uh, my hands on them so yeah all right um as we've just shown holiday stories in the superhero genre can be told in a number of ways and take many forms by themselves they can be memorable moments that help build our heroes up in meaningful ways or they can be amusing delightful little side stories aimed at scratching that holiday itch whatever you're reading this holiday season I hope you enjoyed this conversation about Spidey-centric holiday stories, and we'll consider seeking out and reading the ones we've mentioned today. Aaron, it's been a pleasure, as always, having you here. Uh, Do you have any big plans for the holidays? Yes, I do. So basically, I don't know when this episode is going to come out, but in real time now, I'm about to go on vacation in about four days. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I cannot wait because when I get off work, I'm going to drink some 
adult Christmas themed beverages, which I do enjoy. Shiner Cheer is really good. Uh, stay at home with the family. Watch a whole bunch of Christmas movies. We've kind of cut through our, our movie list as we're going through the holiday. We try to get certain ones that we watch annually, as well as some new ones. We discovered some new ones this year. Do that. Spend time with family, games, going out, having fun. Uh, uh, doing all that with 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 my Parker and Gwen at home, so right. uh, just spending that time with that. So that's that's really my plans. And plus, above all else, sleeping in because I never of get to do, do do that during the regular work week. Do that where you can, you know. No, I I get it, I get it. Uh, we're taking a fairly low key approach to the holidays uh, this year. Um, we're I mean we're not like big on the holidays. We do mm-hmm. celebrate them, but not to the extent that uh, a lot of people do. And so like, I mean, we're, we're, we're the kind of household that we don't, we're, we we do not really do the, like the gift giving on a single day. Okay. It's like if I'm out and I see something that my fiance could really use or really mm-hmm. expressed interest in, I'll, you know, I'll grab it for her if I can and just give it to her just because, okay. you know, um, and so that's kind of the way it works here. Uh, we might go out to my mom's. Um, she she may be doing a dinner on Christmas, okay, um, sort of thing. But uh, you know, I'm looking forward to a fairly low key holiday. I, I always do. And uh, I'm currently on vacation now. Actually, I'm taking uh, my 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 birthday is as you know was recently. It was last week, and yes. I needed to kind of work through the week anyways, and. Um, my birthday was on a Tuesday, so not exactly a great night for going out or anything. <laughs> so I just kind of worked my regular week and then I just took the week after off. So that's what I'm doing right now. Okay. And, um, yeah, just, uh, just, just kind of enjoying that time off. I'll be going back to work next week and I think, uh, things will be fairly slow and there'll be, it'll be peppered with days off. And so I'm pretty happy about that okay so um, i'm 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 expecting a, a fairly relaxing holiday even though i'm going to be working through a lot of it so um right now my big plans are when i'm uh you know while i'm off i'm going to try to catch up on editing the the podcast i'm a couple of episodes behind and i'm going to get those out i'm going to work on doing some editing some youtube videos and getting those posted okay and then playing Fortnite and hanging out and streaming and just kind of enjoying my time off so that's that sounds like a lot of fun that sounds like a lot of fun yeah so uh and uh where again can my listeners find you online these days yes so i am on instagram at suicide fox with two x's uh you youtube you can youtube search me at front row negative where i do a lot of unboxings with mystery stuff uh mystery shirts mystery hats uh, recently, I did one for uh, wrestling action figures, which was oh. also a, was kind of a letdown just because of of what was sent. Um, but oh, right. yeah, I, you know, hey, mystery stuff—it's a gamble. It always is. It is. Sometimes it makes for good content. Sometimes it makes for bad content. But people like enjoying seeing. People apparently enjoy seeing me. Uh, uh, my reaction of not having good things go my way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm on there. We have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram front row negative all one word. Uh, I have a store, which you can get the shirt that you're currently wearing right now. From Again, the store. love this. This is an so, excellent shirt. Thank you. So, so funny enough, I mean, I designed that shirt a full year before my son was even a thought uh, or even born. And it just happened. Oh, wow. that, yeah. So foresight, the sense was the sense was there. Um, but the web of life was guiding you. <laughs> the web of life was there. Um, but I have plenty of other designs. Uh, get them now before they get cease and assisted. Because while I have ideas that I would like to see in shirts, the people who own those licenses do not. So uh, that's just bad. just to kind of throw it out there. But I have that store, uh, and that's pretty much it. Okay, and um, I will uh, do what I can to include links to all of those things in the live stream description and the show notes whenever I do get this episode out to audio services. So, 
All right. And uh, again, thank you for being a part of this episode. Um, And uh, let's see. Thank you for listening. And let's move on to the Web Spinner's recommendations. Mm -hmm. Okay. For this week's Web Spinner's recommendation, I'd like to recommend a film that's been around for a good couple of decades at this point and that never really fails to get a reaction from me whenever I watch it. I'm speaking of the 2003 Tim Burton film, Big Fish. Now, for anyone that has not seen this movie, I'll just put it to you like this. Um, it is the story of a the grown son of a man who is, um, he's, he's at the end of his life. Uh, he, he, he had a stroke. And the son and the father have some distance between them. They're both storytellers of a type, but the father had a heavily mythologized account of his life that his son, upon finding out as an adult were essentially fictions, created a rift between them. And the movie goes through these recreations, these stories of the father's life as the son tries to piece together who his dad actually is. And so you see you see witches, you see werewolves, you see an uncatchable fish, you see, you know, um Siamese twins and you wonder where the line is between what is real and what is not. And at the end of the film you wonder just how much it actually matters. This is a great film that is a tearjerker for anyone that has ever had any kind of, if you have a close relationship with your father, if you have a fraught relationship with your father, it's one of those movies, especially near the end, that just unfairly just kind of kidney punches you in the heart. Uh, definitely worth a watch. It features, it's it's a Tim Burton film. It also features Ewan McGregor, uh, Albert Finney, Helena Bonham Carter. So it's got a lot of good actors in it as well. Definitely recommend it. Again, the film Big Fish for this week's Web Spinners recommendation. Aaron, do you have any recommendations for my listeners to read, watch, play, or listen to? Well, well, it is the holiday season. And normally one of the movies that we watch every holiday season, uh, since we found it on streaming, but before that we had... Oh, we only had it on DVD was Jingle All the Way. Love that movie. Okay. <laughs> fun movie. Great fun movie. And it's good. But about two years ago, another movie came out. That's basically a it's a jingle all the way for the kids who grew up in the 80s. And it's called 8 Bit Christmas. And oh, just seen and, it. <laughs> and just replaced Turbo Man with NES. Yes. And it's got, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Steve Zahn. It's got Steve Zahn. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Uh, you, you, yeah. you, you, like, you have a lot of people who are on like, the brink of becoming famous, like a, lot, a lot of young actors. And it is a funny, funny movie. Because they do things in that movie that we were all thinking during the era of the Nintendo age, meaning whenever uh, Rob the Robot came out, if you had it, you were cool, but if you actually played with that thing, it was terrible. <laughs> the Power Glove, terrible, looked cool. Yeah. That Wizard movie made it look cool. Yes. That thing was terrible. <laughs> so, A Bit Christmas, I feel, is a good new adaptation of Jingle All the Way. But it gives the actual opinions that we all had as kids during the Nintendo era with gadgets and things that came out and what people would do for Nintendo. Because I tried to do those things too. I was in I was in Boy Scouts. I wanted to sell a lot of things to try to win a Nintendo. Didn't happen. I was like beat marginally by somebody whose dad was the manager of a of a factory and was able to gain more attention. But 
I always I recommend them in this movie. It's so funny. It's it's just it brings back a lot of memories of like when I was growing up of how things were mm-hmm. like with you know Christmas time, uh, and I enjoy it with my kids. They laugh at the spaghettio scene, and if you and you know what I'm talking about, it's something that stands out. Yeah. So highly recommend Eight Bit Christmas. I believe it's on Max, I think, or it's on one of the streaming sites. But if you go to Walmart, it's in the five dollar bin because I bought the DVD from the five dollar bin because <laughs> it's it's so because it's, it's just so entertaining. It's just a great movie. I remember being pretty damn entertained by that movie. <laughs> I watched it, and I think that was what probably two years ago. Yeah, about two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I, I remember I remember telling my fiance, I'm like, okay, we need to watch this. And so we watched it. She's, you know, she's marginally into it, but there were certain scenes that she thought were, she thought were uh, genuinely <laughs> funny. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I remember being a kid. I remember being a kid and wanting a Nintendo for the longest time. And so I really needed to watch that movie. So it was, it was fun. It was fun. It's definitely fun. Like that has become one of our annual traditions is to watch that movie uh, just because it's kid friendly. But it's also funny for adults. There's a lot of adult jokes that are made for the adults in there. Right. Not not lewd jokes, but just jokes that reference things that adults would get when they were a kid during that, during, during that era of a uh, of time. No, so. no, I I agree with you. I agree with you. All right, and I believe that brings us close to the end of the show. If you enjoyed this episode of The Webline, please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on my YouTube channel, simply named Spidey Librarian, where I also maintain a playlist of all podcast episodes. The Webline is also available on audio services, so when you see us on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or another such service, please leave a review, rating, and where possible, follow us as well. You can find me on my socials under the name Spidey Librarian on Threads, Twixter, as I'm now calling it, Instagram, Facebook, WordPress, and Twitch. Finally, if you'd like to shoot me an email, you can contact me at spideylibrarian at gmail.com, where I'll be happy to hear your thoughts, rants, and ideas. You never know. Your email might be featured in an upcoming episode. Next week's episode of The Webline will be the final episode of 2023, and we'll be appropriately doing a Spider-Man Year in Review episode to top off the year. I'll be rejoined by Lewis Films, and for the first time, I will be joined by Tyler Osby from the podcast Codex, History of Video Games, as we talk about the big Spider-Man events of 2023 and what we hope to see from the Web Slinger in 2024. How was 2023 for Spider-Man fans? And what hopes do we have for the future of the Spider-Verse? You'll have to tune in live on Sunday, December 17th, to find out. Thank you for listening, and until the next episode, I'll be wishing you a good day. Bye.